uh, temperature and variation of that temperature is fairly close to what's been observed. In terms of the future, uh, that's the low emission scenario that David put up before. Um, this is a high emission scenario and this is where we're heading at the moment. Uh, to put that into context, uh, by the end of the century, at the upper end of that red uh, sort of fan of possibilities about a six degree change, that effectively takes the rainfall from central Queensland and puts it down, uh, sorry, the temperature of central Queensland and puts it down over Melbourne. So if you track, say, 600 millimetre ISO height down Australia, um, that's what that means. So these changes are far from insignificant. Um, we know that the agriculture in central Queensland is very different from that in Victoria. Um, we can say a priori that as a function of climate change, we will need to adapt to that sort of scale of change. If we look at what's already been happening in Australia, this is just a, a graph straight out of uh, Bureau of Meteorology or data straight out of Bureau of Meteorology. I've just uh, removed the rainfall signal from the temperature uh, trend here. Uh, and then just put a 10-year running mean through that. And what you can see here is that there's uh, just a, a steady increase in temperatures across southern Australia. Um, so that's where most of our agriculture occurs in Australia, at least without the extensive uh, bed cattle in at the north. Um, there is no evidence that we've had a slowdown in warming, as you might hear from uh, various sources. Uh, what it's doing is just increasing and increasing steadily. Uh, one of the other implications of this, if you look at that graph, is what's a, a cold year now um, is actually hotter than the hottest years that we might have experienced when I was uh, a small child. And so, in a sense, we're already starting to emerge from the envelope of historical variation uh, into a new situation. We don't have to wait 20, 30, 50 years for climate change. It's already changing. Um, and there's already a clear human imprint on these changes. In terms of crops uh, and, and the impacts on crops, this is work from Scott Chapman and uh, Amy Zeng. And this just looks at the timing of the first hot day uh, of the year. So that's a, a day when the maximum temperature is above 35 degrees. And this compares a baseline that was in the 1960s versus uh, the first decade of this millennium. And you can see from that graph up in the north, central, uh, north part of the uh, cropping belt, uh, we've almost had a three week advance of that first hot day. If we're looking down around this region, that's about one week. And if you look over the west, it's just a, a day or two or no change. So these uh, changes that are already occurring uh, in our um, cropping systems in terms of biologically important events. Uh, Scott's put together uh, the, some data from the National Variety Trials and mapped this uh, rainfall versus uh, your mean yield. So it's essentially a French and Schultz type uh, relationship. Uh, we've got um, the, the uh, sort of essentially a, a water use efficiency, that's the, the diagonal line up to the right. Uh, and each of those dots is a, a, a value from the uh, National Variety Trials, and the colour of those dots indicates high temperatures during, during the flowering period, during that high vulnerability period. And what you can see from that is for a given rainfall amount, so essentially removing the drought influence, you can see that there's not only a high amount of variation in yield, so you get a big variation there, um, but a lot of those four yield years happen in very high temperatures during flowering. And so uh, I'm not suggesting that this is necessarily a sign of climate change, but simply that those high temperature conditions are overly associated with uh, low yields in that trial. And, and so in a sense, we can say from this and other information that high temperatures matter. Um, we can get uh, examples where, um, say in South Australia just uh, a year or two ago, a um, really significant heat event uh, at a very vulnerable period of the crop and it reduced crop yields by 30 and sometimes 50% on a farm by farm basis. So, so these are things that actually really cut in at different times. Now in terms of water, um, the basic message is uh, signals of, of reducing rainfall, particularly in northern winter and spring in southern Australia, uh, less certainty in what happens in the north of Australia. So it could be wetter, it could be drier. Um, although on average it tends to be a bit drier in most of the, the north as well. When you translate that to runoff, which integrates temperature and rainfall change, um, this is a picture coming out of the IPCC, analysis of pulling together different model results. It's changing in runoff in millimetres from our main catchment areas, uh, so the top of the Murray Island Basin system here. This is the median estimate of rainfall change, and you can see pretty much right across the board, uh, there's expected to be some reductions in runoff in those catchments. Uh, the best 
the conditions, that's the 90% percentile result, uh, is actually um, increased run uh, run up in the attachments. Uh, and but if you look at Tassie and parts of Victoria, even under the best scenario, it's reduction, uh, which doesn't look really good for some of our irrigation systems. Under the worst case scenarios, it's the driest 10 percentile results uh, that there's effectively um, drying everywhere and significant reduction in the runoff. Uh, the implications are obvious uh, for the red baskets um, down here, um, but also if we're looking to develop the north. Um, so under these circumstances, there's a fair chance, according to these models, that we'd actually get very dry conditions, which would um, reduce the economic viability for some of the suggested uh, developments up in that area. And the other part of this that concerns me is these global models don't actually pick up um, the variation in rainfall that we've seen in the northwest. So, so they don't actually get that um, trend of significant increases in rainfall over the last decades in the northwest. So their ability to simulate um, some of these uh, things in the north is questionable. So significant uncertainty in terms of that. Now what do you do about that if you're a farmer? Well, adaptation is called business for a farmer, regardless of whether it's in Australia or any other country. Um, if we actually start to think about the climate change and climate variability, if we don't adapt, there's likely to be an increased gap between what are the realisable outcomes and what actually happens on a farm. And for the, if you're uh, dealing with crops, for example, the consequences of actually not adapting to climate means you either underperform or you think that incur increasing risk than you otherwise would. And both of those are undesirable if you're trying to double uh, production in a reliable way. So the consideration, the, the rationale for um, thinking of adaptation uh, is extremely strong. We don't want to either underperform or incur increasing risk. So when I talk about adaptation, it's essentially just changing what we do to get what we want. It's just changing our practices uh, to achieve goals which are set by farmers and farmers groups and sometimes governments as well. And always adaptation is done in the expectation of benefits. So there's always an expectation that by adapting you'll be better off than you otherwise would be. So in a sense adaptation is, is always about positive um, and it's about solutions. Just to pull this into a frame which uh, resonates with what David was talking about, sort of risk return sort of things, and understanding trade-offs. Um, this is just one, one way of presenting this, it's a very simplistic way of presenting it too. Um, but if we have a situation where you've got increasing risk on the x-axis, increasing productivity on the y, um, you can get some sort of uh, shape like this um, in many systems. It's not shaped like this, but just for the sake of uh, illustration, I'll do this. Um, and we, we can say that, well, if we are a farmer, like that little um, hexagon down there, um, often those farms are well operating well below that risk return frontier. So, so that risk return frontier is essentially the best you can do uh, in any circumstance in terms of production versus risk. The dotted line is, is essentially a, a situation which says, well, this isn't inflexible, it actually changes and it can change for a variety of reasons. So if we're just dealing with, say, a 100 year view without climate change, um, you're sitting below the risk return, what you actually uh, risk return frontier what the, the agenda is, is you improve your agronomy and you say you can actually move towards that frontier. Um, and you can move towards that frontier in different ways. You can uh, you know, increase your production but at the same risk or vice versa. Um, if you start to think about, say, um, the things that this centre is trying to do, it's actually trying to change that risk return frontier. This is the AMU centre. And it's actually trying to push up um, that boundary, that frontier, so that for any given risk you actually have a greater return greater productivity. And, and so that improved genetics um, is one way of fundamentally changing these relationships. Uh, you can actually do that also through improved value chain, establishing effective markets. Uh, and you can also increase that relationship, say, by CO2. So the things that David was talking about, uh, improved water use efficiency and a higher CO2. So this risk return frontier is not a fixed thing that will change the environment changes, um, economic and environmental. In Australia, where we see climate changes generally being negative, that's high temperatures, lower rainfall, lower runoff, uh, that risk return frontier on average will actually shrink, it will actually move down, uh, so that for any given risk, your production uh, will increase, or for any given production level, your risk will increase, depending on how you want to look at it. So, the other part of this is that under climate change, if variability increases, that's a key part of the GCM results, 
is that uh, a rational decision is in fact to move down that risk frontier. So that's the arrow up there. So it's actually to, to reduce your risk, um, reduce your investment and reduce your production. So the challenge for us is how we actually do what those little blue arrows are doing, which is actually push up that sort of change enforced on us by climate change and push that back up to where we are now or perhaps above that. And then that's one of the challenges I think for the centre. So to do that is um, we've engaged with farmers over a long period of time. So this is work from Steve Crimp, but Andrew Gordon in the audience has done this as well and various other people. So what we've done is we've actually gone and engaged with farmers and we've said, okay, given these sorts of climate changes, what are the sorts of adaptations you undertake? Uh, and, and we've actually done this progressively with the same groups um, over time. And so, so what we can actually say is that um, they come up with initially a whole series of very agronomic uh, sort of solutions. Um, some of these on this uh, sheet are similar to what David um, presented in his uh, presentation. But, but what happens over time is as you engage with these people, they move from an agronomic focus to a business management focus. So they start to see that the key things they need to change isn't the little things, the incremental change, the varieties, but it's in fact their whole approach to business and um, juggling the trade-offs and changing their goals in some cases. And is this being translated into, into change? Um, well, certainly there's intention to change. So I well, worked down in Victoria, um, surveying farmers about the types of change that they're actually undertaking in part due to climate change. And we see some really significant results here. So over two years of study uh, in the survey, which is I think 1,200 farmers, so that there's a precise sample. Um, but almost half of them were talking about changing their, their business structure and management. Um, almost, uh, you know, over a third were actually talking about changing enterprise mix because of the climate changes they're seeing. Uh, some were talking about changing starting new enterprises and diversification, and others were looking at uh, leasing land or changing location, so changing land use. Um, uh, and so when you actually look at this, is that these farmers are really taking on board messages of adaptation, even though if you survey them, most of them, probably only about a third of them, most of them would say that climate change due to humans is not happening, only about a third of them would actually say that there's anthropogenic climate change. And to sort of do this sort of change, uh, we've, we've uh, engaged in a, a whole stack of social science and institutional analysis and started to understand what are the constraints and enabling factors uh, that uh, instigate change. And what we find is that this change is very significantly depending on the sector you're working in and depending on the region uh, we're working in. And so we've got a fair handle now on what are some of the things that are needed to be done to actually get adaptation happening. Uh, and there's, a, a, I think, a pathway forward um, that we can design, uh, but that would need a significant involvement in policy uh, in that pathway forward. Just, again, revisiting the, uh, this risk-return sort of uh, view of life, um, if we're just, again, just focusing on the production perspective, these, these little hexagons are clearly embedded, they're not real data points. Um, but just to, to make the point is that Probably the biggest gains that we can have in the short term are through building capacity. So it's through social science um, rather than through major genetic change. And that's effectively moving that cohort of people who are down in the bottom part, the red uh, hexagons, um, up towards that risk return frontier. So the good farmers in Australia are already um, pretty much maxed out in terms of where they are in, in terms of that risk return. It's actually about how you um, move the rest of the farms. And, there's a preferential uh, sort of almost self-selection uh, with researchers to actually go and work with the best farmers. So, so when we go out and work with, with the farmers, we're almost always working up towards that frontier. We're not working with the people who are down this end of the spectrum. So there's a, um, a real important um, bit of social science that's needed to be meshed into policy to actually make those changes. The other thing I'd say about this is that um, when we look at risk return, we don't necessarily take into account all of the dimensions of decision making. So, for example, you could say, well, one of the reasons why people are performing well under that frontier is because they're making decisions which favour environmental outcomes above production outcomes. And so, in a sense, you need to have a multi-dimensional um, relationship here. And I don't think we've actually done the work that allows us to really pin that down. Um, having said that, though, at least in grazing systems, those farmers who tend to be right near the top of the risk return frontier are also in many cases those who are actually looking after the natural resources and have higher 
and biodiversity of their property as well. And so, so I don't think it's automatic that uh, there's um, a hard trade-off in, in terms of uh, production and uh, environmental performance uh, in these different systems. And just uh, one of the key things that can happen in terms of increased production is uh, you can either increase production at a site, so increase your yields, which has been the focus so far today, or you can in increase your land area that you plant up, so you can expand your, your cropping area. And I just want to put a couple of uh, graphs up here of what's been going on in this region, uh, in the high rainfall zone of New South Wales, over the last several years. So what we actually find is that this, which was essentially used to be um, largely grazing, high rainfall grazing, um, uh, we've actually found a significant increase in the cropping area. So as the millennium drought cut in, what used to be too wet for grazing, um, now actually, uh, sorry, for cropping, actually now became suitable rainfall uh, for cropping. And this is not independent of changes in varieties, so we've actually bought in um, high rainfall uh, um, varieties. But we can actually see that there has been uh, an increase, not by a huge area, but definitely an increase. Uh, in the cropping in this area. And that's very consistent with what we've seen right around the high rainfall zones in Australia, where you go West Australia, South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales. In those high rainfall zones, we've seen an encroachment of cropping into what used to be grazing land. And, whoops, um, and if we look at the equivalent side of grazing, we can actually see a decrease uh, in the area of grazing. So as the cropping goes up, the grazing goes down. Now the importance of this from a, a broader perspective is that uh, as you convert um, grazing land into cropping land, you lose a lot of the carbon in the system, so you become net in for quite a significant amount of time and, and quite a significant amount of carbon. Uh, and also, various aspects of biodiversity and ecosystem function that were related to the grasslands that actually get sacrificed, and so they, they become defunct. And, and there are ways to actually both have your cake and eat too um, in these areas, using things like pasture cropping, where you can both maintain some growing grass and grow a winter cereal. Uh, but they're um, still limited in their adoption. So there are, and, and, and those pasture cropping systems often do have good biodiversity, so you can actually go out there and see quite a lot of functional groups in terms of biodiversity. So, so there are ways of, of managing these changes which actually can achieve multiple goals that they're not necessarily being adopted at the moment. And just a, a, a flip to the importance of this land use change from a, a, a much broader perspective. This is a, a graph from Brian Keating, uh, which shows the um, change on the basis of an area, area index or an um, index of cereal areas from the baseline being about 1960 uh, and an index of cereal yield. So it's comparing trajectories of uh, area and yield in different regions. So, so down here on the right hand side is what's happening in sub-Saharan Africa. On the left hand side is uh, Europe and up the middle is Asia. And what we can see if you look at the uh, European story is basically over that 50 years or so there's been a reduction in the area crop um, but a major increase in the yield. And so a really great story in terms of agronomy and uh, development of agriculture in those uh, areas. If you look at Asia, there's been a small increase in the area, um, but uh, and again, a major increase in the production. Again, a different story. But if we look over in Africa, um, it's a very, very different trajectory. And, and so that's one where there's been a major increase in the area, um, but very little um, per area increase in the yield. And so what this is saying is that you can go on very, very different trajectories, which are quite stable over time. So there's those relationships over time are very stable. These, these are the trajectories which once set, they just keep on going. And, uh, and it's one of the really important things I think here is actually to think about these trajectories and change that sub-Saharan Africa one to something which looks like more like the Asian or um, European experience. And the sorts of genetic uh, breakthroughs, disruptive technologies that we're seeing may develop uh, could well contribute to those sort of challenges. Um, it's not going to happen easily because those trajectories are very stable. And lastly, um, just a, a slide which just is about thinking about climate adaptation, not from a little box around it which says um, we want to separate climate adaptation out from broader sweep of agricultural development and innovation, but rather seeing this as integrated into that um, development. Um, so I, I'd actually like to see uh, climate adaptation be seen as a, a key source 
of agricultural innovation. It's a major functional change in the G by E by M relationship. We're getting a big change in the D, we're getting big changes in the M, uh, we're looking at big changes in the G, um, and we need to reframe uh, how we're going to respond to this, and, and climate change is definitely a part of that. So the sort of things that can come out of having a focus on climate adaptation as part of that broader innovation system is ways to reduce risk, um, ways to increase productivity, uh, ways to actually invest in relevant technologies that may not otherwise be invested in, uh, and approaches to integration of systems, including across the value chain and to looking at ecosystem services as part of the solution, not separate from the solution here. If we do this well, I think we can actually reinforce uh, getting new, better and contextual options uh, which can be put in place both in places like Australia and in the developing world, including some of those transformational changes. I, I haven't dwelt on that today, but um, thinking out of the box in terms of uh, your agricultural systems. And David um, mentioned that uh, briefly before. Um, and if we're doing this again, um, adaptation, I think, can actually renew and revitalise uh, some of our engagement processes. Because to do this well, I think we'll actually have to really ramp up the two-way transfer of information. Because a lot of um, farmers and policy makers actually have information which is very relevant uh, to effective adaptation trajectories. And, and lastly, if we're going to do this successfully, we're going to have to really work at integrating adaptation to climate change or climate variability um, with other issues, particularly the mitigation challenge. So we're going to do dumb things in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions when we adapt to climate change. Uh, and things like water resource management, which I think are going to be increasingly challenging over the next few decades. In all of this, um, we have to be aware of those sort of trade-offs. We have to be able to relate this to some sort of risk-return relationship um, that allows us to make informed judgments on what we want to do and what we don't want to do. Thank you very much.